Good afternoon and welcome to the CMAS webinar series. We will just get started in about two minutes to allow people to join. Good afternoon. Welcome to the CMAS Center's webinar series. My name is Sarav Arunachalam. I'm here with the UNC Institute for the Environment and the Center for Community Modeling Analysis System. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Baron Henderson from the US EPA to talk about global sources of North American ozone today. Um, Dr. Baron Henderson is a physical scientist in the Air Quality Analysis Division's Air Quality Modeling Group of the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards at the US EPA. He uses theory and computer simulations to explore scientific and societal issues related to air pollutants. Barron's body of work advances process level understanding within air quality models and uses those models to quantify integrated impacts of air pollution at local to regional and global scales. Before coming to the EPA, Barron was an assistant professor at the University of Florida. His research there ranged from South Florida's single source issues to characterizing pollution in Bogota, Colombia, to characterizing chemical kinetics important for local range, long range transport. His work at the EPA includes collaborative research to improve atmospheric models and quantify global contributions to local pollution. Please welcome Dr. Barron Anderson and a quick announcement, um, we'll have Baron give his presentation, and then after he's done, we'll take questions. I encourage all attendees to use the Q&A tool on the Zoom to ask questions of the speaker. We will collate the questions and post them to the speaker after the end of the presentation. And this presentation will be recorded and made live on the CMAS Center's webinar resource pages, both as a presentation and the recording will be made available. Please welcome Dr. Baron Anderson. Baron. Thank you very much for that. I realized that one thing that I didn't put in my bio was uh, that I got my PhD and master's at the University of North Carolina, so go Heels. And uh, I got my bachelor's degree at Austin College, which is a smaller, smaller college in uh, Texas. So it gives you a little idea of where I'm coming from and uh, where I've been. And, and now I'm gonna focus on the talk at hand, which is the, the global sources of North American ozone. One of the great things about being back at the EPA where I was a, a postdoc before I went away to be a faculty member um, is that at the EPA you have access to uh, a wide variety of specialists who can help with lots of different pieces of any project, which means that any project you see has had a lot of individuals working on it. So I've put some EPA collaborators down below and I've also put some of our, our contracting support collaborators in there. So a lot of people have, have touched pieces of this work and I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, and of course, any EPA presentation needs the disclaimer below. Um, this is a science talk and I'll be talking to you about the science that I've been evaluating and it doesn't necessarily reflect the views or policies of the US EPA. So this is really gonna be a, a two part talk. Um, I'm gonna give an, an overview or a background of the talk in general, and then we'll jump into some details about the modeling system that I'll be using, both how it's set up and the evaluation of it. Um, and then we'll go into, I'm sorry, it says part two and part three here. Um, and then we'll go into part two, which is the model attribution results. <clears throat> 
So as motivation and background for this talk, I'm gonna talk about what are background concentrations. So in 2018, I got to be part of a collaborative work that looked at the background ozone sources. Uh, that's the Jaffe et al. 2018 paper that I encourage you to look at, and I've put the DOI in the right-hand corner. In that paper, we talked about background concentrations as non-controllable ozone sources, so INCOS, and those INCOS contribute individually, those individual sources contribute to background ozone, which is essentially the ozone that is not going to be controllable. But that begs the question, what is controllable? And to some extent, that depends an awful lot on your context. Is it controllable by the US? Is it controllable by a state? Is it controllable by a specific non-attainment area? These are, these are questions that have to be answered when framing background. For the most part, as a member of the United States EPA working on a national scale, I'm most interested in thinking about those things that are not controllable from the perspective of the federal US. Right. So when we talk about non-controllable ozone sources, that's relatively easy. We think of things like stratosphere. You would have to wall off the stratosphere from the troposphere if you wanted to stop ozone from coming down. I'm probably not going to do that. Um, lightning NOx, that is a precursor to ozone, the nitrogen oxides that are formed by lightning strikes. Uh, unless you want to geoengineer modification of lightning, uh, there's very little to be done about that. There's the wildfires and biogenics, which represent VOCs from uh, VOCs from trees or the biogenics and wildfires have a, a variety of emissions. And all of these things have uh, uncertainty. And when we look at the combined non-controllable ozone sources, we typically, or rather in the, in the Jaffe paper, we assigned a seasonal uncertainty of plus or minus 10 PB. So there's a lot of sources coming together. And on the right-hand side, I've got a, a graphical representation of those sources. But I also have a stacked bar plot on the right that shows if you added them all up at a particular site, and this is sort of a make-believe site where we've just added concentrations, and you stack them all up, you would see that each one of the background pieces contributes something, and then the interstate transport represents something, and then the locally produced, in this case, the state contribution represents something and together they exceed the standard. So the national ambient air quality standards are looking at the total concentration and it doesn't matter that much where individual pieces came from. Unless it's controllable, in which case there are laws that allow us to recommend implementation of controls. So controllable, again, that depends on the context that might be the non-attainment area, the state, the country, or even to some level international, there are treaties that have binding and non-binding agreements that allow us to encourage other countries or other countries to encourage us to put controls on our sources. So ambient air has all those sources, the non-controllable as well as the controllable. The non-controllable can be important. They vary strongly from year to year, depending both on meteorology and on transport pattern, uh, sort of general transport patterns, as well as temperature and climate. Um, but in addition, the non-controllable ozone sources can vary from model to model. So two different models may not give the same answer. So what that begs us to do then is to create more estimates of the non-controllable ozone sources. And, and here what I'm talking about is a system that was set up to create what I'm calling zero out estimates of ozone contributions. So we know there's interannual variability. And in this case, the EPA wants to look at the year 2016 as an important part of the policy assessment for ozone, uh, which is a five-year document that they put together, that we put together. Um, so if there's interannual variability, we need to do something for 2016. If the modeling system matters, then we want to see what happens in the CMAC modeling system that was recently extended to be able to work at northern hemispheric scales. And we want to use our latest emissions, and here we're talking about the 2016 platform. Um, so all of those things have changed. So we want to create new estimates. And when I talk about estimates of non-controllable ozone sources in this talk, I'll be talking about the natural ozone and I'll be talking about the international anthropogenic. So natural and international anthropogenic. 
when we're thinking about the controllable, I'll be calling that domestic anthropogenic. And for short, I'll be calling that USA. So that would be United States anthropogenic, not United States of America. So again, natural is global natural sources. International is the international anthropogenic and USA is the United States anthropogenic. Now, in addition, there's this other component that I'm gonna call residual. And sometimes I might call it either or both that sort of thing. So what happens is when we do zero out estimates of ozone, there's a little bit that can't quite add up perfectly. That is, it either requires emissions from both controllable sources and non-controllable sources, or if you take away one, the other will make up the difference. And so you have non-linearities and you have some ozone that's not directly attributable to either. So on the right-hand side, I'm showing some hypothetical contributions. The orange is gonna be the domestic component, which I'll often call the USA. The blue is gonna be the international. The gray is that nonlinear residual. And then the green is the natural. I'm laying out these colors because they're gonna be important to the rest of the presentation. So orange is always gonna mean US anthropogenic. Blue is always going to be international and green is always going to be natural. So coming up with these estimates all starts with a modeling platform. So we create a, a modeling system to try to reproduce what's happening in the real world. And we're going to start there. And then we'll talk about how we get the individual estimates. So the part one here is going to focus on the modeling system. I'm going to describe the global to hemispheric models that we're using, the emissions, both the natural and the anthropogenic. And then we'll focus on how the model performed. We'll look at it at seasonal average ozone. We'll look at ozone compared at sond locations that I'll talk about more in a little bit. We'll talk about evaluation at CASNAT sites, which represent sort of less urban environments. And we'll also look at the TOR database and we'll look at the satellite records. And, and I'll use the satellite in sort of a semi-quantitative way. So um, doing quantitative analysis, but recognizing some of the uncertainties in the comparisons that I'm making. So to start with, uh, we used both hemispheric CMAC and GeoSCAM. Everything I'm going to talk about today is really coming from the hemispheric CMAC version, but I like to compare the two to understand how the results might be different if we uh, had used GeoSCAM, which we will probably do some sensitivity analyses of. So the hemispheric CMAC platform is using version 5.2.1, which has uh, a potential vorticity estimate of the stratosphere. It has windblown dust emissions, and it has halogen chemistry. We're running the model for eight months to spin it up, to get it prepared to run uh, a, a real environment. That's gonna be done on a polar stereographic grid, which is approximately one degree by one degree, but it's 108 kilometers by 108 kilometers in a polar stereographic projection. We're running 44 layers up to 50 millibar. And the meteorology for this system is coming from the weather research and forecasting version 3.8 system. We also have some sensitivity studies that we've done with GeosChem version 12.0.1 with a one year spin up and a two by two and a half degree uh, structure with half size polar cells. That system has a 72 vertical layer and goes up to 0 0.01 millibar. So it's a very different vertical structure. And we did those runs with the Goddard Earth Observing System forward product, the Geos FP meteorology. When we're talking about the natural emissions, that's going to largely be made up of biogenics, which are either plants and soils, um, wild and prescribed fires. Uh, depending on how you treat prescribed, you can either lump them in with the wild, in which case they'll show up in your natural, or you can separate them out and call them anthropogenic. We're going to have lightning emissions, inline dust, sea salt, and dimethyl sulfide. Because this is an ozone talk, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with you about the biogenics, fires, and lightning. So the biogenics for both um, 
for both Hemispheric CMAC and GeoSCAM, we're using Megan version 2.1 as implemented in GeoSCAM. We actually produce the emissions in GeoSCAM and then extract them out, regrid them, and pass them to Hemispheric CMAC. Within, and that's also true for the uh, soil NOx, which I'm noticing is not up here. So the soil NOx is the Berkeley Dalhousie nitrogen soil parameterization, which again was run in GeoSCAM and regridded for Hemispheric CMAC. Within the hemispheric CMAX system, though, over North America, we replace the biogenics and soil NOx with the BICE parameterization that is more commonly used in regional applications of CMAX. For the wildfires, it's a little bit more different between the two systems. Geoschem was using uh, GFED, and we tried a, a trial run of FIN with version 1.6 before that was retracted. Um, and then we also used the hemispheric CMAX version with FIN version 1.5. And over the US and, and Canada and Mexico, the fires are coming from the 2016 platform, not from FIN version 1.5. In Lightning, Geoschem has a representation produced by Lee Murray and we made sure to integrate his latest updates so that it could be applied to 2016. At this point, those are part of the standard model, but at the time they needed to be patched in. The, Hemispheric CMAC is different. We're using a climatological average lightning that's been spatially allocated and temporally allocated to make it representative, but it is a climatological average. There's more details about the emission inventory in the um, EPA TSD, and Jeff Bukovic gave a talk at CMAS 2018, and his presentation is available on the website archive. From an anthropogenic standpoint, we're using Edgar HTAP, and I'm gonna now focus more and more on hemispheric CMAC. So hemispheric CMAC, we used HTAP, but the HTAP inventory version two was based on the year 2010, and we needed to project that to 2016. To do that, we used the community emissions data system, the SEDS system, to create interpolation factors to bring it forward, but it, we could only bring it to 2014. So we interpolate out to 2014 and use that as a surrogate for 2016. For the international shipping component, and this is the shipping outside the, the US waters, we're using the Edgar HTAP estimation, but within the US waters, we're using the 2016 modeling platform for the shipping emissions. Geoschem used a more complex um, set of different inventories, ARCTAS, ICOADS, et cetera. And then for aircraft, um, we're using the Edgar HTAP aircraft and Geoschem was using the AEIC inventory when we ran those results. And again, if you want more details on the specific emission inventories, you, when this presentation comes out, you'll be able to click on that link and it'll, it'll take you there. Um, and there are a lot of good details in that document. So I really applaud um, Jeff and Allison for putting that TSD together. At the regional scale, the hemispheric platform is using our 2016 emissions platform. But when we started this work, the version one was not available. So we're using what is sometimes affectionately referred to as the 2016 alpha or the 2016 FE platform. We were using the Environment Canada, now the ECCC, um, 2013 emission inventory interpolated to 2016. And for Mexico, we had a um, on-road emissions from moves for the year 2016 and other sectors were scaled forward from 2018. Perhaps one of the biggest differences between our modeling system and some of the others available is actually the China inventory. What we're using is the Tsinghua University emission inventory that is documented in the Zhao et al. Um, Proceedings of the National Academies paper linked below. And it's a little bit different for uh, the years after 2012 than SEDS is. And that's because they implemented in their emission inventory a lot of the controls that China was putting in place, for example, on the metals processing sectors. And as a result, the sulfate is considerably lower than you would get from the SEDS database. And so is the NOx. There are other controls that they were putting in place that aren't represented in the forward growth um, in the years 2013 and 14 and beyond in, in SEDS. Um, 
So we do look at some sensitivities to see how different these assumptions are, but we are using the Tsinghua University of China Emission Inventory. So when we put that into the model with the emissions, what does it look like? And the first thing I wanna say is when we talk about what does it look like, this domain is gonna look pretty different than some domains you might be used to working with. This is the polar stereographic grid here on the right side. The US is always gonna be in the sort of dead center bottom. Africa is gonna to be to the right and up and China is directly above the US. So when we're thinking about transport patterns, they're going around like this. And that'll become more obvious later when we're looking at the contributions and the flows of ozone. But I wanna make sure we get oriented now so those things make sense later when we're looking at them. These two domains here, the smaller domains that are inset, represent that when we ran the hemispheric result, we created boundary conditions for a 36 kilometer run. And from the 36 kilometer run, we created boundary conditions for a 12 kilometer run. So this is a multi-resolution, multi-scale system that covers the entire North America in most places out to about um, three degrees north, but at the corners out to negative 13 degrees south. Um, but largely we're using it to focus on the mid latitudes. So just qualitatively, um, when we look at the ozone, we wanna make sure that we see the things we expect to see. What we're looking at here is the spring. This is the average of March, April, and May, which will sometimes be abbreviated as MAM. So this is the Northern Hemisphere spring. And what we see is that near the surface, the concentrations are relatively low. You can see the transport patterns, for example, over the Pacific and also over the Atlantic. So those transport patterns are, are pretty nicely defined and you can see their pathways. As we move up in the atmosphere, the lifetimes are, are very long um, and the deposition is not present when we're higher in the atmosphere at about five kilometers or about 500 hectopascals. So you really see these very high concentrations and those high concentrations are transporting again in this circular pattern that the polar hemis the polar stereographic grid lets us uh, see. When we move to the summer, the surface concentrations over the oceans are lower, but the surface concentrations over the continents are higher. That's because it's near the surface, the temperatures are a lot warmer, the lifetimes are shorter, so the transport pathways are not evident at the surface in the same way they were in the spring. When we look at the upper troposphere, the transport is still very good. If you can loft ozone into the free troposphere, the temperatures are still colder at those higher altitudes and the transport is more efficient. But one of the things that you see is getting the ozone into the upper troposphere, the free troposphere, has a lot more association with convective activity and you can really see the turbulence in these transport structures. So you don't see the perfect smooth transport patterns that you saw in the spring. So we saw what we expected to see. We saw a longer transport in the spring. We saw higher over the continents in the summer. But how does that look when we start comparing it to actual observations? We're gonna look at the World Ozone and Ultraviolet Data Center's SOND database. We're gonna look at um, 29 sites with over a thousand launches. Many of those are in uh, North America and Western Europe. So there is um, a disproportionate coverage. In the upper right-hand map, you see colored dots that represent the different SON locations. And the width of the dot represents the number of SON launches for each one of those sites. So you can see there are a lot of launches in Europe, whereas there are fewer launches here along uh, Japan. We're also gonna look at the CASNET database. Um, these are large scale simulations that we're evaluating. We're starting with the hemispheric transport. And so we don't expect it to capture the urban gradients because it has a 108 kilometer grid cell. So we're looking to see how it does at sites that are more rural in nature. Um, and the last thing is we'll look at the Iagos system, which is the uh, takeoff and landing measurements from aircraft. <clears throat> 
So let's jump right in. Here, what I'm showing is the World Ozone Ultraviolet Data Center SONS, where I have averaged them across all times. So we're looking at the annual average at each one of these sites. The sites are ordered from south to north for the observations in the first panel, from south to north for the model in the second panel, and from south to north for the ratio of the model to the observations in the right-hand panel. So what you can see is near the surface in the um, tropical latitudes, there's some overestimation going on. As you move to the mid-latitudes, you see more and more um, performance within 20%. So that's between uh, 80 and 120 percent of the observation. And when we look in the free troposphere, we see a lot of observations within the 80 to 120 percent of the observation. But you do see some interesting structures of, of low bias that extend into the free to free troposphere and even down to the surface at a couple sites. But the other thing that you see is this darker blue line that moves from, uh, from high elevation to, to lower elevation uh, in pressure units. That represents a low bias that's happening right near the tropopause. So right near the tropopause, perhaps we're not mixing enough of that ozone down. So that might represent an underestimation of stratospheric ozone from the potential vorticity of parameterization, which it turns out there's a paper about the same time we were publishing this, suggesting that um, there is an underestimation of that. So that's generally good news. The free troposphere is relatively unbiased. There are some problems up here by the tropopause and that probably represents some underestimation of stratosphere. Now what I'm looking at is those same SOND observations, but now I'm averaging them across all the sites and we're looking at them as a function of time. So from January 1 to January 1 of 2017. And the features that really jump out here are the SOND observations show a clear seasonal signal where the stratosphere is lower in the model. Um, I'm sorry, is, is bringing ozone down lower in the model's vertical grid than the model is. So the model does represent some increased stratospheric contributions here in the spring coming down into the model but not as far down as are present in the observations. And you can see that right away comparing the two, but it really pops out when we look at the ratio. So when we're looking at March, April, and May near the tropopause, we really have an underestimation. That underestimation extends down into the free troposphere during uh, late spring, but it by and large clears up as we move into the summer season. Okay, so now we're looking at aircraft flights and I'm gonna look at two places in particular. We're gonna look at a couple aircraft launches near Japan, which represents the outflow for Asia. And there's a lot of uh, highs and lows and scatter. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me is in some cases, the observations, which are this first panel and the predictions, which are the second panel, actually do very much the same thing for some really weird outliers. So you see this blue line here, the very dark blue, we have a very low ozone concentration at uh, this measurement here. And the same feature shows up in the prediction. So we have a really anomalously low ozone concentration during that aircraft takeoff and launch. And sure enough, the model captures it. In the same way, there's an anomalously low concentrations here near to the surface between uh, the surface and about 500, I'm sorry, about 700 hectopascals. The model picks that up on some of the days, but it actually misses the beginning of it, which you see here. When we look at the ratios again, there's a lot of scatter. It's hard to really pick out exactly um, what's going on, but you do see there tends to be some high bias in the ozone coming out uh, during the summer. If we move over to Hawaii, so if, if Japan was represented 
representing the outflow from Asia. And now we're looking at Hawaii, which is representing more of the air having transported further along. And again, I, I should have been more clear on these panels on the last slide. The first one is the observations. The second one is the predictions. The third is the ratio. And now we're looking at the individual takeoffs from Hawaii as a function of the day of the year. There are March to July observations are missing. So we're, we're looking at January and then we're jumping right to August and then we're missing October and we're going to November. But that's just because the observations weren't present when we were downloading them. So we're looking at what we have. And again, there are some uh, anomalously low concentrations in the observations that, that one might think would be hard for the model to pick up, but sure enough, it gets them. And, and that's really encouraging. And there are also some anomalously high values that the model and the observation pick up. And again, in this case, the anomalously high values that are near the tropopause are not coming deep enough into the model, which gives us this low prediction near the tropopause. So all in all, it looks pretty good. We see some overestimations, some underestimations, but it, it's not wild. So that's really encouraging. When we look at the CastNet monitors, um, here I'm showing you every hour of every day is a scatter plot. And we see generally a, a pretty good relationship between the observations and the model. But of course, there's a fair amount of scatter. If we look at that in space, you see that there are lower predictions in the west, whereas the east tends to be less biased. But if we look at all of the sites as a percentage of whether they are high bias or low bias, there are more sites in the CastNet database that are unbiased, that is between negative 2.5 PPB bias and 2.5 PPB bias, with a tail that is lower bias from 2.5 to 12.7. So this is pretty good performance for a whole year hourly evaluation. Um, we can look at it lots of different ways, but this really sort of tells the story from us thinking about the seasonality, things become more interesting. So on this slide, we have the observations in the upper right, the model, and then the bias as a function of the hour of the day. And what I've plotted on there is the white line is the mean of the observation and the black line is the mean of the model. And so you can see the model is average low bias compared to the model. And you can see that in the bias where in the spring, most of that bias or model is mostly low bias in the spring. But by the time we get, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead in my words. In the early morning, there is a low bias, but by the time we get to midday, that low bias is largely gone. We have a density of observations that are unbiased. And again, as we move into the late night, we start to get lower biased. What we can then do is break the observations down into observations from zero to five a.m. local standard time and from 11 to 17 local standard time and look at those as a function of day of the year. And so what we see is in the spring, which is what I was saying earlier when I was pointing to the hourly plots, in the spring, we tend to be low biased. And as we move into the summer, we're unbiased or even a little bit high biased in the morning hours. By contrast, if we look at the afternoon hours, we're relatively unbiased, a little low biased in the spring. And as we move into summer, there's more high bias. So we can look at those and use that evaluation to understand the results or put the results in context later when we talk about attribution. Now, like I said, we also looked at the, the satellites. Um, and in this case, uh, here the satellites to the aldehyde product, we compared the in a two from the satellite, the in a 2D high resolution product to the model. And then we also compared the Smithsonian Atmospheric Observatory ozone profiles to the model. And all of these are available in the appendix to the ozone science 
I'm sorry, the ozone policy assessment, which is currently available in draft form and, and will be coming out in the final form soon. So if you're interested in looking at different months, what I'm showing here is July, but we did that for other months as well. So in general, the model is doing really encouraging. Um, it does tend to have a, a near tropopause low bias. That low bias tends to be northward of 50 degrees. Um, it's performing similarly overall to the geoskin platform that was used for our, our 2011 system. Um, but it definitely shows some low biases that we'd like to better understand and improve. The aircraft tends to show a little bit more mixed results. It's kind of hard to draw much of a conclusion from there. Um, the cast net observations between June, July, and August are pretty good, but the spring tended to be low. And again, that's probably related to the stratosphere low bias that, that was evident in the SOND evaluation. I didn't show it here, but we looked at the TOR database and we used the TOR five-year average as a climatology to compare to our results. And, and generally at the rural monitors, we tended to agree quite well. When we initially were doing this run, we were comparing it to a version uh, 1102 from Geoschem, and it had sort of the opposite direction. It was a little on the high bias side, whereas this was a little on the low bias side. And so we ultimately decided that we'd stick with hemispheric CMAC for this round of simulations so that we could try using an integrated platform. So again, that led us ask the question, how does using a different modeling system influence the results that we get. We are currently testing a Geoschem version 11.01, I'm sorry, 0.1, uh, and also a version 12.8. So we will see what comes of that. So that gives you a sense for the modeling platform and how it was doing. But really the whole point of this was to get to some attribution estimates. So what I'm gonna talk to you now about is how we use that modeling platform to come up with estimates of the US anthropogenic, the international, and the natural. So that's bringing us back to what we were talking about before. Then I'm going to show some results and we're going to think about the long range transport, both in terms of the surface concentrations and also in terms of the aloft, which is the transported. When we're at the larger scales, like 108 kilometer, we have more zero outs that we can look at. So we can look specifically at China and India separately from all the other countries of the world, for example. But when we're looking at the surface, Surface results will be working on an eight kilometer model, but we'll also have that 12 kilometer model that I talked about before that's nested down from the 108 kilometer. When we do that, we won't have China and India separated, and you'll see why when we look at the results. So we'll just have the natural, international, and USA. So how did we do that? So all of these predictions start with a forward model that takes meteorology and emissions. So here abbreviated F for the forward model, M for the meteorology, and E for the emissions. The standard system uses total emissions, which has the sum of all emission sets. The natural emission run only has the natural emissions. The zero international has natural and the US anthropogenic emissions. In this case, we treated prescribed fires as anthropogenic fires, and then, and also agricultural fires. And then the zero USA run, which is sometimes referred to as the US background run, has the emissions that has natural and the sum of international, but it doesn't have the US anthropogenic. So graphically, what does that look like? I'm showing the NOx emissions, the total on the far left, the next is natural, the next is the international anthropogenic, and you can see that there are no emissions over the US. There are also no emissions uh, over any of the, uh, the non-continental US areas either. So Alaska there is, is white because those have been turned off. And then the zero USA, which is the natural plus the international without the, um, the US anthropogenic emissions. We can take all those different forward models and we can estimate the contributions by the equations down below here. So natural is simply the zero anthropogenic forward run. The USA contribution is the total run minus the zero USA. The international is the total minus the zero international and so on. But when we do that, we end up 
with a nonlinear system producing results that don't perfectly add up to the total. And that's where that residual term comes from. The residual is the nonlinear component. So after we've estimated natural, USA, and international, we subtract those off of the total to calculate the residual. But we don't stop there. We take that international component and we split it into pieces like China, shipping, India, Canada and Mexico and other. So we have lots of things to look at and uh, it's, it's you know, very exciting. So again, we'll start here by, by looking at the average transport just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So in this case, we're looking at the aloft measurements and you can see in April, the clear transport pathways. By the time you get to July, it's more disturbed. In October, it's still disturbed. And if we were to look at the surface concentrations, again, in April, the transport pathway is more clear than it is in July. And again, I've plotted a reference that has the USA, Africa, China, and South America, so that you can look at these plots and understand what you're looking at. But what we're gonna do now is break those into pieces. So we're looking at April, aloft, so at about 500 hectopascals. The green, remember, is always natural, blue is international, and it's USA. So what I'm showing you is that aloft, you have huge concentrations in April from natural sources. That represents the stratospheric contributions, as well as, for example, the April fire you would get in Indonesia and other places that are closer to the tropics, whereas you don't see the fires until later in the year in the mid-latitudes. When we look at the international shipping in April, there's not a lot to see there. The concentrations are heavily weighted towards the pole. As we look at Canada and Mexico, there are some high concentrations down by the Yucatan, high contributions, I should say. When we look at the other anthropogenic, there's, there's a lot going on there. So this represents everywhere that we haven't talked about so far. And we can look specifically at the China contribution. And you can see that the China contribution is a small component of the overall. And then we look at the US contribution. And it's important to remember that just like we are downwind of other countries, other countries are, are downwind of us. So you can see that our contribution to other countries is in the same general range as China's contribution is to other countries as, as well. So this is again at 500 hectopascals in April. Now we're looking at July. July uh, in the aloft area, now you're seeing higher natural contributions further over the continents that tend to have moved northward closer to the mid latitudes. Again, that's representing the fires, it's representing the soil knocks, it's representing all the natural processes. When we look at international shipping in July, things have shifted a little bit. We no longer see the centralization around the pole. Uh, we see a more evenly spread contribution with a few hot spots. When we look at Canada and Mexico, it's now sort of blowing out the other side of um, the Latin American peninsula. And when we look at the other anthropogenic international contributions, a lot going on here. Um, and again, so that has transport from Europe, from Africa, from Russia, from China, from India. And I'm just gonna show the, the China piece here in July. So now the uh, China transport is a little bit less uh, far reaching from the continent, but there are still contributions over the US. And remember we're at 500 hectopascals. And the same can be said for the US to other countries. Now, our focus is primarily on the US. So we like to look at the contributions to the US. And in general, it's nice to split the country into two pieces. There's the East and the West. One of the things I wanna point out to you in this upper right-hand map is that the West has all of the high elevation areas, excluding the Appalachian Mountains, which still as high as some of the mountains in the West. So high elevation areas are this darker gray. The lighter gray is all of the West. And the darkest, the black, represents the near border areas. And so we can think of the, the country as East and West, but we can also think of it as high elevation, low elevation. We can think of it as near border and non-near border. When we look at the 
west and the east in high elevations, that's a little bit less important, but it'll come into to play later. So we're looking here at the seasonal evolution of natural, as well as the India in red, the international shipping in purple, China in maroon, Canada in dark, Canada and Mexico, primarily Mexico here, in dark blue, other non-US anthropogenic in lighter blue, gray is the nonlinear, and the USA is the orange. So remember in the West, you're, you're at high elevation and you haven't had a lot of interaction with the US continent yet, so you don't see as much of that anthropogenic US contribution above the US. As you move eastward, you start to see that the contribution from the US is is going up, but remember we're still at a very high altitude, so the concentrations have not mixed upward as much. We can focus in on just the anthropogenic pieces, so now I've just removed the uh, natural piece, and there are a couple interesting features to note here. One is that the long-range international, so that would be your, your China and India, tend to decrease as you move into the summer. And we expect that because the lifetime of ozone has gone down. This is in contrast to the Canada and Mexico transport, which is actually increasing. So of course that also makes sense if we think about the fact that Mexico is operating more like a local source than it is like a transported source to some of the areas in the West. When we move to the East, really more all of the international sources are, are decreasing as we move in towards summer. And the other country contributions at the aloft elevations is anywhere from 10 to 15 ppb depending on the time of year. Now what I'm doing here is I'm flipping things around and I'm just reminding us that everybody's downwind of somebody else. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the uh, contributions to the European Union. Um, here I have the other non-US on top because at the time that I made this plot, I didn't have European Union separated by itself. Um, but you can see that other countries are contributing large amounts to the European Union and not least of which among them, the USA. So here we have the USA in orange, Canada and Mexico in dark blue, China in maroon, international shipping in purple, and India in red. In addition to the EU having upwind sources, so does China. So in this case, we do have China by itself. So you can see that China's local contribution to the upper troposphere increases in the summer. But you can see that they have international contributions from upwind areas as well. Among them, of course, is even ourselves. So it's important to remember that when we think of long range transport, it's not a one way street. The Northern Hemisphere is acting like a circle. And so everyone's upwind of somebody else. Oh, and my little joke there was that um, when I look at the EU, um, I'm including the UK as well. So that's just based on when this plot was made. All right, so now we're gonna move down to the surface. We're looking at April. And again, in April, you can see the natural coming along this transport patterns coming out of uh, Asia, coming over to the US, but these are the natural contributions. When we look at the surface and international shipping, we now see a lot of international. So remember the shipping is all of course at the surface. And so the contributions are larger and you can really see that here along the Pacific coast. When we look at Canada and Mexico near the surface, they obviously have their largest contributions to themselves, but you can see that the Canada and Mexico contribution creeps inward to the US to the, to the April average concentration of between two and four PPB, depending on where you are. When we look at China at the surface in April, when the temperatures are low, that transport pattern is still pretty active and you can see that it encroaches into the US a little bit, probably into California and Nevada. Um, and when you look at April US contributions, they're primarily local, but then this transport pathway to Europe is pretty evident. Um, 
And just a, a fun fact here, a fun note is that um, some of the only reliable observations that we have are from near Paris in 1876. And what you would hope is that our model natural would be consistent with a pre-industrial atmosphere as it was measured. But because we have so few measurements during that time period, one big question is would those concentrations be representative of the rest of North America? What this plot shows us is that we're actually doing pretty well where that pre-industrial observation would have been. And no, it is not representative of the rest of North America. Okay, now we're moving into July at the surface. So this is where we're typically having the um, largest US contributions and when we typically have our ozone season. And now the natural contributions you don't see the clear transport pathway across the Pacific at the surface, but what is happening is there's lofting at the semi-permanent low system off the coast of Asia, and there's a semi-permanent high system off the coast of the Western US that brings those concentrations back down. So there is transport happening in the model, it's just not as clearly happening at the surface. When we look at the international shipping, now you see lots more ozone being produced by international shipping. It's, all, it's kind of fascinating how it really shuts off the transport into the U.S. is relatively small, and that's likely because the ozone is being produced over active halogen chemistry um, and then uh, is also subject to high deposition. Um, but, of course, it does encroach into the US and it doesn't go to zero. So we're between 0.1 and 2 uh, when we're at this light blue color. Um, when we look at the surface for Mexico, you can really see Mexico coming in in July into the Western US, into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, even as far up as, as Colorado perhaps, um, at 2 to 4 ppb in July. But it really depends on the day. Remember, the days that are most conducive to transport are usually less conducive to local photochemistry. When we look at, at China, it makes perfect sense that in July when transport is less efficient, China's contribution is mostly to China. But of course, on this scale, uh, there's between 1.1 uh, and 2 ppb contribution in the rest of this area. So we're not resolving that small bit over here. Um, and the U.S. contribution is, is similar again. We see the local contribution is very large. The transport pattern is still present, but it's more muted because the lifetimes of ozone are shorter. But beyond this clear transport area that's up in the 2 to 4 ppb range, there's a large area that's between 0.1 and 2 ppb. So now we're gonna go back to the surface. We're gonna go back to looking at things seasonally. And this is a little bit different because now we're looking at the 12 kilometer modeling. So the 12 kilometer resolved results and we're looking at the surface of the US. I'm still breaking things up by west and east for now, but we'll get more distinctions in just a moment. So what we see is that the natural contributions are peaking in the summer. Now remember what I said was we're probably underdoing the stratosphere back here in the spring. So there's probably some natural contributions that we're not getting. But you can see that the international contributions are peaking in March to April, maybe even March to May, and decreasing as we move into sort of the traditional ozone season for the U.S. When we look in the east, we see that the um, international is smaller in general, and it decreases more clearly in the summer. The natural component has a double peak feature happening in um, late April as well as early October. Um, and the anthropogenic is very clear. One of the things I want to point out here, though, is we're averaging over the entire West. The purple rings here represent urban areas. And you can see that most of the West is not urban, whereas most of the East is urban. And so these are sort of unfair comparisons when we look at the two, because if we chose just an urban area, for example, the Colorado area, it would tend to look more like the Eastern average than it would like the Western average. 
But nonetheless, these give us a, a high level picture of what's going on. Now what I'm looking at is I'm splitting the west into the near border areas and the high elevation areas. And what you see is that the near border areas have a lot more international when you move into the photochemical active season, the traditional ozone season. Whereas the high elevation areas have a large amount of international contribution during the spring, but it tends to taper off as you move into the summer. So being near the border, you have long range transport during the spring. Remember that's your Asia and Europe and Russia, et cetera. And as that long range transport tapers off as you move into summer, the semi-local transport from Mexico and Canada increases. And as a result, you have this buffered, longer international transport season at the near border areas than you do at the high elevation areas. Um, and here I'm defining high elevation as above 1500 meters above sea level as defined by the 12 kilometer grid cell average. Um, and one of the features that pops out is when we look at the top 10 days for, in this case, international is in red. This is the one place where I broke my color scheme. Um, what you see is that areas that are like non-attainment areas, for example, Phoenix and Colorado, tend to have lower international contribution than the areas around them. Why would that be? Well, in a non-attainment area, there's local photochemistry contributing to the larger concentrations, which tends to push the top 10 days towards the traditional ozone season when transport is at a disadvantage. And when I say transport is at a disadvantage, I mean anything beyond 100 kilometers from the border. So as long as you're relatively far from the border, you start to see these, these non-attainment areas exceedances happening more often in the summer, especially in the model that's not picking up some of the stratosphere. And as a result, the international contribution to those areas is lower than you would expect from the Western average as a whole. When we look at the West and the East and really focus in on the international component, now you can really see what I was talking about. We see that international shipping, China, and the rest of the international is peaking here in the spring in between March and April. Whereas the Canada and Mexico contribution, that's darker blue, is peaking closer to August. As a result, you have that clearly buffered effect of long range transport contributing more international in the spring and close international contributing more in the summer and a more flat profile for international as a whole. Whereas in the East, the long range transport is, the long range transport is basically inclusive of Canada and Mexico and all of them are tapering off as we move into the traditional ozone season. Now, one uh, fun thing we did to evaluate the model was we compared the population weighted impact uh, for emission sensitivities from our modeling system to some other modeling systems, including one published in 2009 uh, in the supplementary tables S1. And we found pretty good agreement in the relative magnitude of the sensitivity to India and China even though the absolute magnitudes of their contribution were different. So what that tells us is that the absolute magnitudes are maybe different because of differences in efficiency of transport pathways based on the modeling year we chose, but their relative contributions are more equally sensitive to those transport patterns. Okay. So we've used our zero out simulations to provide estimates of contributions. Sometimes it's easier just to call it attribution because people have very strong feelings about whether a contribution is source apportionment or a contribution is tagging or a contribution is zero out. 
but for the moment, we'll just call it zero out contributions. We looked at the global natural, the international anthropogenic, and the domestic anthropogenic. We split out the India, China, and international shipping, and we have some runs that we're working on that allow us to distinguish between Europe, Russia, uh, East Asia, and West Asia um, that we'll be adding to this body of work. What we found is that our results are generally consistent with the literature, like HTAP phase one, HTAP phase two, the Jaffe 2018 paper. The USB, that is the natural plus the international, is higher in the West than the East, and it can be a significant contributor on specific high ozone days. The long range transport tends to happen more in the spring than the summer, which is a nice feature to help us distinguish which types of national transport. The Canada and Mexico here are operating as a short range transport, which is a nice distinction to have. It helps us understand why it's easier to see the international contributions some places than others. And there's a big difference between the West and the East, especially at the surface in the natural contributions between the West and the East. And this makes sense because of the high elevation and because of other things going on there. But what I wanna point out is sometimes you won't see this if you do a regional source apportionment estimation because there's very little natural sources as you move further west. You can imagine as you move to the east, all the air is coming from the west and it's moving towards you. It's picking up emissions as it goes, including those natural sources. So if you take a, a measurement of source attribution in the east, it includes all of that evolution. Whereas if you took one in the Pacific Ocean in a regional domain, there wouldn't have been very much natural ozone contributions because it wouldn't have reached the surface at that point. So we have to make sure that when we're thinking about contributions, we're thinking about it on a holistic perspective and we're not just thinking of the boundary condition as this mythical thing that includes you know only one thing it's not a black box that contains whatever you want it to it is made up of a combination of sources both natural and international anthropogenic as well as some residual u.s contribution okay if we look at the top 10 days at the surface during the summer, the international contribution at most places was between one and 15. Near the border, we have some contributions up to 30, but I'll tell you those individual sites, I think the model tends to be a little high biased. Um, and in the Eastern US that decreases from all sources, the international decreases as you move into the summer. Whereas in the Western US, the contribution from Canada and Mexico is, is increasing. So hopefully that sketches out the, the global sources, or in this case, really the Northern hemispheric sources of North American ozone and how it varies depending both on the source, on the season, the geography, and even the topology. And with that, I'd love to take questions. Looks like I went a little longer than I meant to. We have a few questions. Thanks, Baron. We have a few questions come up on the Q&A panel. Excellent. Um, starting with the first one, um, how will these results inform future development of CMAC? Uh, that's a great question. So the potential vorticity is something that is uh, being worked on in terms of increasing the, the scale at stratospheric contributions. It's something we're thinking about. That's number one. Um, number two is that when we look at these results, we do a lot of different types of evaluation and it helps us to, to think about what we could do better in the future. Um, for example, um, how much did it matter that we did day specific soil nitrogen oxides in India? Probably not a lot in terms of the contribution to the surface in the US. So we can use these results and sensitivities to develop better rules for developing emission inventories to make it easier to do this type of work in the future. So that's not development of the CMAC modeling code, but it's development of the CMAC modeling system. Um, in addition, one of the things that we can do is we, we can really see in this modeling system that the fires tended to be 
over predicted in, in several places, which is consistent with other literature that has, has talked about this in CMAC. And so that adds to the body of evidence there. Um, another place where this comes up is the CMAC model is uh, in the process of developing an integrated source attribution methodology. I think I got that acronym right, the ISAM. And zero out results help to provide a, a reference to see whether or not those new source apportionment technologies are generally consistent with what we've seen in the past. We don't expect them to be the same, but when they're wildly different, we should be asked asking why. And if we can explain that, great. And if not, then we need to, to iterate. And so there's been a lot of iteration using zero out source apportionment methodology. Um, now, another place where this can really help is um, James East is a postgraduate fellow who's working with us uh, over in ORD who's implementing a, a satellite data assimilation system that we collaborate, well, we were stakeholders in the health and air quality applied sciences team that NASA put together last. And they developed a satellite assimilation system that they were able to do a technology transfer to us with. So now that we have these hemispheric results for a whole year with lots of source attribution, we can then take the satellite data assimilation look at where it would modify emission inventories on a global scale, compare that both to our source attribution and to our international emission inventories to see what changes we would make. So those are a few of the places. Um, another, uh, I wouldn't say these results really pushed it, but we ended up having to patch the boundary conditions from these results with the dimethyl sulfide from a newer version of CMAC uh, hemispheric runs because it was important for us to get that for, for regional haze. Um, I'm gonna stop there. And if I think of more ways, I'll come back to that question because it's a great question. Okay. Um, the next one is in a very early slide showing generic source contributions to ozone, it included methane as a source. Can you explain that source a little? Yeah, so methane in this source is really talking about the post-industrial methane. So uh, imagine, uh, or actually it might be methane as a, as a whole, but um, there's methane that's naturally occurring in the atmosphere and that methane is reacting with nitrogen oxides, both naturally occurring and anthropogenic um, to produce ozone. In addition to that naturally occurring methane, we release methane when we do a variety of activities, um, including oil and gas production, including, um, including changes in, in temperature and climate that would, for example, melt tundras and release uh, methane, as well as methane being released from the ocean as temperatures change there. Um, so you have not just the naturally occurring methane, but you also have methane enhancements that are coming from both direct anthropogenic influence as well as indirect anthropogenic influences. And as that methane increases, we change the methane concentrations in our model, which are largely prescribed in air quality models versus dynamic and climate models. And that prescribed concentration is creating ozone. And so ozone everywhere has methane in it. How you attribute that, how much of that methane was post-industrial and thus probably the result of anthropogenic activities, how much of it is pre-industrial, and then of the uh, post-industrial, how you attribute that to different areas um, is an, an area of research and interest. And then there's, you know, if you had a, really high release somewhere, um, just a, a, like a big leak somewhere, you could have a, a very local influence of that leak methane. But in general, when we're talking about these larger broad scale methane concentrations, we're talking about a slow reacting compound that is creating ozone over scales uh, that are regional rather than local, regional to hemispheric to global rather than local. Okay. What ideas are you pursuing for addressing the low bias in the tropopause? 
Yeah, so there's a couple things. Uh, one, you know, we're looking at different modeling systems to see how they perform for this same type of, um, of modeling. So I didn't show it here, but um, I did put in a citation in the presentation that you'll be able to look at later, which is the International Geoschem Ninth Annual Conference, where I showed differences in the satellite sound evaluations between Geoschem and, and CMAC. And so Geoschem, uh, at least at the version that I was showing then, which was version 12.0.1, um, was doing a pretty good job about the tropopause there. And so there are questions about that. Is it a meteorological phenomenon, the way we resolve the, the tropopause, or is it the dynamic UCX chemistry being used for the stratosphere and geoschem versus the potential vorticity scaling that we're using? And so we need to understand uh, those different components to then improve upon it. So if we determined, you know what, our vertical structure is okay, it's the way we're introducing the stratosphere, then we could take some of our geoschem runs and provide top conditions to the model and allow it to transfer down within the CMAC model. And that would be one way to address it. Um, so we are exploring different things with it, but there's not a, a, a clear path to fixing that in hemispheric CMAC to my knowledge, but that's a, a great question to, uh, for the community at large, but also I imagine um, Rohit Mather is thinking about that particularly. Okay. Um, can you briefly outline the two mechanisms for reduction of transport in summer compared to spring for Pacific meteorology and chemical mechanisms? Yeah, so um, as the temperatures increase, the lifetime tends to decrease. So you're essentially speeding up the chemistry that is converting NOx into nitric acid and other terminal nitrogen species. And so as a result, you have the ozone produced earlier, if it's going to be produced at all, you have lower ozone production efficiencies um, on those scales. But as a result, you then have a longer time period for deposition to be occurring to those species. So higher temperatures, you can think of it as more photochemically active um, and also the, the turbulence uh, induces more deposition, I think. Um, so you have more losses. So that's why as you move up in the atmosphere, you tend to see less of this is that the temperatures higher in the atmosphere are more stable less changing. And as a result, the lifetime is more consistent, higher in the atmosphere. Um, I didn't, didn't really understand the second part of the question. Well, I guess uh, the question was trying to think about the processes, both from a meteorology perspective and the chemistry perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, from a meteorological perspective, you have different transport pathways. So when we talk about things like the semi-permanent low and the semi-permanent high, those aren't perfectly static and those are, are certainly moving. Um, and in addition to that, you have convective systems that are occurring at different frequencies depending on the time of the year. And remember a convective system uh, is uh, an extreme low system. And in that low system, you're lofting air up from the surface and you're bringing air from the surface down. So to the extent that you have precursors near the surface, because that's where their emissions are, and you add a convective system, you're lofting those precursors and their products higher into the atmosphere. And so if you're moving them away uh, from the surface and if they stayed at the surface, they would have a, a shorter lifetime, then their likelihood of reaching the surface downwind has decreased. Okay. Um, could you comment on the aircraft emissions and the fidelity of the data? Yeah, great question. Um, so the aircraft emissions that we're using at the hemispheric scale are coming from the HTAP aircraft and they're being scaled by the SEDS data. I don't have a sense for how good those are. I think that there are um, in the 2016, I think version one, but it might be the 2017 emissions platform that's happening right now. There's been some improvements to the, uh, to the aircraft emissions. And I think it'd be really interesting to uh, take something like the SEDS aircraft or the, um, 
or the HTAF aircraft and scale it forward to that year, mask it out for the region and compare the two just to get a sense for how important is it to be doing year specific in terms of raw magnitudes. So there's the uncertainties there, um, which I suspect are, are relatively large. Um, and then there's the emission factors for aircraft, which I know very little about. Um, so I won't speak to that. Um, and in this talk, we're primarily talking about ozone. So we're really talking about the nitrogen oxides. So we're, we're focusing on the combustion processes, which are probably more certain than um, some of the, you know, landing and takeoff particulates. Right, and related to the same sector, uh, two part question from the same attendee. Uh, do you have any insights on their contribution to ozone similar to shipping contribution? That's a great question. There's, um, I believe it's a Tim Butler paper from maybe two years ago, um, looked at shipping an aircraft separately using um, his tagging system called TOAST. Um, that's a good paper that I would uh, recommend you to. We didn't separately quantify aircraft in this case. Um, one of the things we were just talking about this morning with respect to a modeling system is that both the HTAP system and the um, the SED system, or the SED system in particular, it specifies global international flights and global domestic flights. But that's actually going to make it hard for us to distinguish because even if you had them spatially, um, so SEDS has done a fantastic job of making all their data readily available in a gridded format. And I suggest that everybody go out and download as much of it as they can <laughs> and, and play with it and work with it and learn from it. Um, but when they provide the aircraft data, I believe that all of that is merged together. And so you can't distinguish between domestic aircraft and international aircraft over the US in that graded system. They're not held separately, unless I'm mistaken. And so, uh, yeah, I forget exactly why I went down this rabbit hole. <laughs> no, I, I think we, we were trying to distinguish between shipping and, and aircraft. But that, that was oh, what... yeah, so um, because I, I think that takes a lot of analysis and consideration. So when a flight is an international aircraft that is over the US, whose is it? Um, that's a complicated question. It's a landing and takeoff, which in our, in our modeling system, landing and takeoff over the US is coming from the 2016 emissions modeling platform, whereas the cruise altitude outside the US is, and landing and takeoffs are coming from a completely different system. And so there's a lot of good questions to be had about whose emissions are whose and, and do you just draw a box around the US and if it happened over the US, even if it wasn't coming to the US, it's, it's US aircraft. Um, now, no one, no one here has specifically asked me to distinguish aircraft uh, as domestic or not domestic, but it has policy implications. And so I think one reason that we didn't explore that one as much was because of that. OK. Um, all right, mo moving on, uh, Baron, next one. How does satellite data compare to your results shown? Does Landsat data improve the results if interpolated? Um, so the satellite results um, are shown both here and as I said in the draft policy assessment. Um, I would argue that the performance is quite good for ozone. Uh, even for NO2, it's relatively good, um, but it depends where you are, right? It depends an awful lot on where you are. Now, in this case, the way that I've processed the modeling system um, probably prevents too quantitative an analysis of it. Um, but you're asking about the Landsat side of thing, and I, I don't really know what you mean about the interpolation by Landsat. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if it's to do with the land use data, but since it's not clear, um, we can move on and, and maybe have the speaker um, engage with us offline later. Great. Uh, moving on, Baron, next one. Do you have the ability to determine the source regions where international shipping impacts originate? Uh, I'm wondering how much emissions control areas, both in the US and in other nations, address the issue, or the majority arises from locations outside of coastal regions? I'm sorry if you said it already. <laughs> No, no, no. It's a good, it's a good question, and it's a tricky question. 
And I'm going to pull up a figure to help us talk about it. Hopefully, it'll be the surface one. OK. So right here for international shipping, you can see it if you look closely. Um, so inside the US, ECA regions, um, we're using the 2016 modeling platform. And outside it, we're using the, um, the shipping more generally. Um, the ECA regions around Europe, we are not resolving at all. Um, separately, but you can actually sort of see the vestiges of the ECA region um, upwind of the U.S. here. So if you look off the Pacific coast there, you see a slightly lighter color just following a slightly darker color um, right around um, the ECA. And, you know, I think that's probably some artifact of the way we're, we're treating it, but as a result of having multi-scale modeling systems, we can run attribution on the ECA region and non-ECA region, both in the 36 kilometer results and in the 12 kilometer results. The results that I'm showing you are just from a zero out of the entire shipping. So while we can resolve it and we've set up the system in a way that we can resolve it, and I believe subsequent um, attribution studies probably will, these results don't. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, in the East, what levels of international contribution are seen in the Northeast, i.e. the New York metropolitan area, New England? Yeah, so in the New York metropolitan area. Um, so what I'm showing is spatial maps um, that are gridded. Right. If you're interested in a specific monitor, we can extract that monitor and do uh, the same type of evaluation we've done here, except you can also look at the model performance for that. In the New York, uh, like in the New York metro area, like New York City metro area, I don't think it's very large. There may be a high elevation New York State site that is, is a little bit larger. Um, but again, I wouldn't want to speak off the cuff about any particular sites. Um, but I, I will be putting together an analysis that does look at the monitors in the non-attainment areas and does analyses of those. OK. Um, one more. Uh, recent model performance evaluations of EPA's 2016 platform have shown a similar underprediction of ozone in the spring months in the corners. Yeah. Do you think the HCMAC results are a significant reason for this negative bias? And do you have any indication that the geoschem simulations also under investigation may help with this bias? Yeah, so we have a simulation that's currently running where the boundary conditions were produced from the geoschem 12.0.1. And so we will be able to see those differences more clearly soon. We have not, I don't think the runs are complete and I don't think we process the runs, but we are exploring that as, as a question. When we initially ran this uh, hemispheric run and didn't have the, um, uh, did I go too far? And didn't have the regional runs yet, you know, we were struck by these low biases in spring that tended to be stronger at night than they were in the day. Um, and we were trying to interpret those and think about what it was that those likely meant. Um, and I think there was some thought that, you know, we're using a 108 kilometer model with a um, 10 to 15 meter first layer. It could be that there's overestimation of deposition. Um, but the fact that we still see that low bias after we've passed it into the 12 kilometer model makes us think that, you know, it probably is more a larger scale feature coming into the model. But that being said, it, it's an open question, right? Will we get less low bias if we give it more ozone? Sure. Are there reasons to think we should? Definitely in the free trope, less so as we get closer to the surface uh, in the SON record. Um, but yeah, there's reason to believe that, that that could be it. I think we just have to be careful about uh, concluding that giving more ozone is right because we have a low bias. Okay. 
Uh, one last comment. It's not a question. Um, you're welcome to comment on the comment if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> and the comment is, uh, where is that? I just had this. Yeah. The, um, since you're using Megan, uh, you can turn off soil knocks due to fertilizer application and anthropogenic nitrogen deposition to get the better estimate of natural and anthropogenic emissions. Yeah, so this is a really good point. So when we ran, um, so what we ran was Megan and the Berkeley Dalhousie nitrogen soil parameterization, both as implemented in GeosChem. At the time, I believe there was a way to configure HIMCO to separately quantify the anthropogenic and the non-anthropogenic. Um, at the time, we were having trouble getting that configured and running. I think it may have even been more cleaned up since then, so it's easier to do. Um, but we ultimately decided that it was more important to, to go ahead um, than to wait for separating those. Since then, um, I've been looking at the Copernicus modeling system. They've made all of their emissions uh, available online including their soil NOx database. So they have it separated both by natural biome specific um, as well as uh, fertilizer enhanced and separately for the anthropogenic nitrogen deposition onto the surfaces that are re-emitted. So I think there's a lot of potential for that system and the emissions that are made publicly available and ready to use, you know, they take some massaging to get them into CMAC, but uh, those cover the years 2000 to 2015. So that is just an exceptional resource that was made available to us. If you do decide to use those systems, I'd encourage you to contact me or to contact um, the primary author of the soil NOx emissions database that, that they have, specifically because um, the nitrogen deposition re-emission uh, probably had a little bit of a bug in it, and there's an easy fix to clean it up. Um, yeah, but, but separating out the truly anthropogenic from biogenic soil NOx is it, really interesting for two reasons. One, uh, Lapina et al. Um, 2014 did an adjoint study that showed that soil NOx emissions as, an anth as a natural source, or rather as a source in general, tend to have much more localized effects. So on the global scale, soil NOx is like 80% natural, 20% anthropogenic. But on a localized scale, you can have a much larger anthropogenic part. And that localized nitrogen is going to be highly efficient in terms of making local ozone. So the fact that we have treated that as an entirely natural source is artificial. And we recognize that as one of the limitations of our study. Okay, thank you, Baron, for the great presentation and um, answering all the questions. Um, here is a virtual round of applause for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, with that, um, I want to announce that this presentation, um, both as a PDF and a recording, will be made available on the CMAS uh, website. And I have two announcements before we um, wrap up for the day. Let me just pull up the slide in a second. Okay, so so um, hold your um, dates for the next webinar, the CMAS webinar series. We have uh, Professor Tasiana Albuquerque and her student Razire Pedrusi from um, Federal University of Minas Gerais presenting on challenges in using the SMOKE CMAC modeling system in South America, uh, case studies in urban Brazilian cities. So this will be on Thursday, July 9th at 2 p.m. That's the next one in the series. Following that, we have a two-part presentation from EPA OAQPS. The first one will be on the 2016 modeling platform with a broad overview of the performance evaluation. The date will be announced shortly. And the second part of the same two-part presentation will be a little more of an in-depth evaluation focusing on both area and pollutant-focused evaluation. So hold your dates for the first one, July 9th, um, and two more coming up later from the EPA.
And the last announcement for the day is our 19th annual CMAS conference. Um, this year is going to be held uh, the week of October 26th to 30th. And this year, given the general pandemic situation, we will be going virtual. Um, the exact format and details are being worked out. And please stay tuned for the call for abstract that will be coming out really soon. So again, the 19th annual CMAS conference will be going virtual the week of October 26th to 30th. With that, thank you all for attending today's webinar. And thanks, Baron, again for the great talk. And hopefully see you all on July 9th. Really fun. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.